All right, welcome back to another architecture meeting. This one's gonna be pretty much a state of the system meeting where I'm gonna show you everything in its current state and hopefully a successful run through of the front end, talking all the way down to uh, one of my microservices. And then you're gonna see the message post to um, RabbitMQ and then be consumed by a service. So it should be pretty cool. So let's go ahead and start with the first thing here. So this is my front end project and the front end uh, is, is pretty much home base for all uh, communications to to start, right? So this project is going to be my engine simulator. So every all the data, you know, actions, social things are going to originate from here. And then they're going to get posted wherever they need to get posted. So this, everything I think is running. So let's try to go through it now. So this is my front end project. Um, right now, I should say I don't have it running in Docker. I just have it running in um, uh, just on local host uh, on port 5117. And because I don't have doc, I don't have my Docker uh, configured for my, uh, or I don't have my API gateway configured in Docker yet. And Docker, when you host something in Docker, it has a different, uh, understanding of what localhost is so you have this internal host that docker gives you when you when you're doing that so i'm not able to yet call directly to my api gateway that's just hosted uh on localhost um running on my mac so once i get that set up then i have to consolidate it all into my docker compose file and do all that but for the sake of the prototype uh i'm just going to have it running uh here so I'm going to go ahead and call my one uh, backend endpoint that I'm trying to call. And you can see it called there. Um, so you can see we've gotten a response of test. So that's good. Everything's working. And I think I found a weird bug actually in Visual Studio Mac. So these buttons uh, do nothing. I, I don't, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's just the debug buttons. But if I go to debug up on the top toolbar and then continue debugging, it works fine. So I don't know what's up with those buttons because it's like sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, but it's like, I don't know if it's conflicting with how Safari like prefetches URLs. I'm not really sure, but you can even see it's not working there. And then I have to continue debugging uh, and then it goes back to my browser fine. So I don't know, but that's aside, beside the point. So if you see me like clicking those, that's not doing anything. It's not my application. It's, it's something with Visual Studio for Mac. Um, but you can see our return test. So test is actually coming from this microservice here uh, that's running and it's returning just a 200 status code with uh, the string text. And you can see it's publishing to my uh, RabbitMQ message broker, which is running also right here. And then I have one queue set up for engine. And if we go to that, you can see some things have been posted there. Um, and then if we go to that uh, service that's actually ha registered to have a consumer, you can see that it consumed that engine I posted uh, right there, which is um, here. So I'm taking the message and then I'm just outputting it. So basically what we've done is we've established uh, this front end project is posting to this URL here. So localhost, port, and then gateway post data. Gateway is my uh, API gateway that's running as well. And that basically handles all upstream and downstream routes. So I'm hitting this upstream route gateway post data. And it's a post method. So I'm sending a uh, serialized JSON object of my engine model to this uh, uh, gateway endpoint. And then it's going to pass it down to this downstream API engines post data, um, which is this... Uh, which is this endpoint right here. Um, and then it outputs it. And then uh, obviously you can see I'm just creating a new fixture in the pet or engine model and passing it to publish. But I'm, I am passing the original one, so I don't really know. It, it was just when I, I just have it set up because that way when I was testing it, I just had to post data to the message bus before I actually got it connected to a calling application. Uh, but you can see that it outputs what I sent it and everything works well. Um, so I think that that's all the moving parts and we'll do, we'll run it again just so you can kind of see the flow. So everything originates from the front end and let me set breakpoints 
so you can kind of get a feel for how things are operating um, and kind of understand hopefully what's what's this the basically the series of communication how everything's taking place so I'll go back to my front end and pretend this is like a you know fancy button or whatever but basically when that's called it's gonna go okay it's gonna go back to this data controller uh, endpoint which is this part of the back end front end pattern that I have set up for my my front end so everything routes through the front end's back end here so that should allow me to kind of make it a little easier to uh, perform authentication and things like that uh, so no that button's not going to work so continue debugging uh, then it goes immediately to my engines API through my uh, API gateway so this allows me to have the front end not really know what the, uh, not really have any true knowledge of this engine's API microservice. And then from here, let's see if, so this one allows me to step forward. I don't know what's going on. But uh, you can see it posts to the message bus and the returns. And again, the consumer here, uh, I, th I pr probably already consumed. Yeah. I don't know if it'll let me... Uh, Let's try to do another one and see if it if it hits that breakpoint. Oh wait, I think I still got something waiting. Yes, I do. I need to continue <laughs> debugging again. All right, let me post another message and then see if we can get it to hit on my um, registered uh, consuming service. And that's making me crazy. I don't know why that button is not working on that instance of Visual Studio. Let me just make sure that that yeah. So immediately when it posts the message bus, you can see that the con register consumer is not called directly, but rather it's it's registered to be a consumer of that type engine model from my RabbitMQ message bus. And the very next thing we're going to be doing after this uh, after this video is basically we're going to be uh, taking you know, that consumer outside of this microservice, right? Because this engine's API is really going to be handling uh, what are we doing with the data that were passed and then where, which microservices do we need to send the data. An example is if we get an engine that's registering uh, super high heat, right? You know, I don't know, 450, 500 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to have a, a temperature microservice that when if it's flagged, it'll send it over to that service to, to uh, or sorry, that microservice will be registered to consume uh, engine model or however we structure it. But for this example, we'll say it's registered again to, con to consume the context of type engine model. It'll, it'll get that from the message bus. So nothing connects to it directly, but that service is registered to consume anything that comes in that queue of the same type. So then we can say, okay, we can give it a bunch of logic. You know, if it's, then we can do whatever we want with those kind of numbers. Like if we want to pass a notification that tells you, hey, your engine's running too hot, you got to do something. Uh, that's going to work really well because then we can just add any microservices that we want to that message bus without having to touch any code um, from, our in, from our front end, engine API, API gateway, whatever it is. We can just keep adding stuff on there. Um, and so that's the part of the prototype that I had to get set up first is just register be able to successfully register a consumer of my engine model type uh, and just, you know, be able to manipulate the data as I need to. And that's the the working example I have. So I believe the next part I'm going to be doing is probably moving this off into its own microservice uh, or several, depending on how much logic I want to, I want to put in right now. Um, but hopefully the flow kind of makes sense. Um, so again, you can see my Rabbit MQ server running locally, uh, but you can see, you know, how many things are required for this kind of setup, and you know, obviously one like, you know, one knee-jerk reaction to this is you, you know, it feels like a lot of work. You know, it feels like we're doing a lot for just passing one model down to uh, some service to to manipulate. Um, and I get that, but it, but at the same time, all these pieces are going to fit together in a in a pretty loose way to allow us to scale things independently. Each microservice has its own repository, so they're completely separate. Um, 
and being able to work with a message broker like RabbitMQ is going to allow us to register things to consume things off uh, to consume messages off that queue and and act on them and it's not going to tie up any resources on the front end right so if we're sending a whole bunch of data down to that queue um, by way of our, our whatever engines API we have set up uh, all that's all it's going to do is it's going to publish publish data and then return back uh, a 200 and then the front end is going to work super smooth because now it's not tied to anything happening in the back end because if we add if we continually add more features like check for heat uh, check for social um, check for you know is the carburetor set up fine what's the exhaust profile all of a sudden we start getting 10 11 12 features that um, if we had to run those like you know either uh, sequentially you know asynchronously whatever however you want to do that 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 just puts further constraint on the time that your front end has to wait on something to do in the back end uh, and it also opens up the possibility for a lot of data to be lost because if if that time if timeout numbers continue to increase you know latency increases we'll start to get errors because the front end is unable to talk to the back end that's not going to happen with a message queue because it's just that it's a queue it's going to store messages to be consumed at some point by the registered consumers and that's going to work really well because as we just saw we get this really clean flow uh, and no microservice has any as really any notion of another one the front end doesn't know of the engine's API's existence. All it knows is that it's sending a request up to this API gateway. It's it's sending uh, this JSON object out to this route, and it's return it's it's getting returned back something, right? Yeah, but it doesn't know what that is, and it works really well because now you can have a team dedicated to the front end. They can work completely independently. You can have an API gateway team. You can have an engine's API team. And then you can have all my microservices teams that all just rely on what's being sent to RabbitMQ because now you have a contract in place, right? You have a contract that says, okay, you know, you're micro, you're the, uh, you're, I don't know, you're the, you're the piston team, right? You handle what the piston data is, the heat, the, the, the bore, the stroke, everything like that, uh, the rod, you know, the length of the rod, whatever. Um, all you know is that you're going to be set up to consume engine model, and here's the data that's contained in that class. Uh, and then you, all you have to know is what you know. What am I? What am I intaking, and what am I returning? And that's it. And as long as you have that set up, you're square, and you're in your own repository, and you and you know you're just consuming off this RabbitMQ message broker. And it's easy because you can set it up locally to test easy, because all you need to have is a local host running. Uh, your RabbitMQ server, and then you stand up your service. Hopefully it's not dependent on others, and then there it is. And if it is dependent on others, you can just use Docker Compose locally and get everything set up how you need to. So this this really unlocks a lot of potential. But again, it feels like a lot of work. But in a large-scale setting that needs to be highly available, this is one potential pattern that you could use. A counter-argument to this would be if you want to just stick to more of the monolith pattern, is you could register background processes or like worker processes in, in the, as classes that are just continually uh, checking for uh, any data that's that's stored in some kind of queue. Like if you if you uh, if you set up like a buffer queue or something like that in .NET, you could register a background uh, service to run and then check that queue every five or ten seconds or one second, whatever you want it to do. And you could achieve the same kind of, you could achieve the same functionality uh, pretty much like this. However, you're all contained in one monolith. And that may be appealing for some contexts. You know, if it's, if it's, if you're your own singular team, that might work. If it's a really small application that really is not going to see a lot of, uh, you know, activity or data, or it's not, it's just not going to get a lot of traction. You know that might be that might be a route to go. It also, you know, heavily e uh, makes deployment easier. Uh, everything like that because this kind of system where you have all these pieces. You know, I'm trying to. Or, uh, I don't know if it's going to only organize them. <laughs> uh, the deployment for this is going to be a little uh, is going to be a, a little difficult, right? Because we got to get the orchestration all set up. But once you have that in place. 
and hopefully you have a team that that handles that um you're in a, you'll be in a really good spot because everything's everything's not tied to each other and if something is not performing then you can scale everything independently um but again you you, know, you kind of got to weigh the pros and cons of your particular uh use case this is just one potential way to accomplish uh, this form of messaging across microservices. Um, another counter argument, I guess, to to this design that I'm still kind of weighing is that, you know, it feels like a lot to go from your front end here through the uh, API gateway to the microservice. Um, and you could argue that you could just set up like a request from the actual uh, you could set up a request just from the actual React front end uh, directly to the API gateway. That way, you kind of skip that first initial back end call to your your front end back end for front end endpoint. And I get that, and that makes sense. Um, however, I think the one uh, the one downside to that is that I think the created assumption in that is that you are authenticated. Um, you can set up authentication to to work around that, but uh, I, I, the benefit I see that if by still going through the back end for front end endpoint is that you can still handle uh, you can still handle authorization. Um, am I thinking about that that correctly? You you can still yeah, so you can still handle authorization like you need to, um, assuming that you've already been like. Uh, authenticated but there's just some advantages I think that you get by doing that but I'm open to possibilities because I'm 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 still kind of going back and forth on that as well um, but I don't know but this is kind of where the prototyping and research stuff comes out to comes into play right seeing what works seeing what doesn't um, the next thing uh, after this is I have to load test everything um, oh, actually, I should show you um, the rate limiting that I that I have set up. So let's actually get rid of all these breakpoints, so that way I can just call everything like I need to. Uh, let's. I think is that it. All right, I think we should be good. <laughs> Let me. Oh. Um. There we go. Let me just spam this endpoint. Oh no. Oh no, we're good. Yeah, so that's my rate limiting. Obviously, it's uh, <laughs> we have to um, uh, make the error message a little cleaner. But the rate limiting is being blocked here uh, by this rate limiter. I have set up for three requests every ten seconds. Obviously, I'm going to be changing that, but that's just uh, the particular tutorial that I was looking at. That's what. That's how they structure these options here and then I just took those options and put them here so I have to change that to however I need it to be uh, but you kind of see how that could be useful obviously it's it's just a singular spot where you change that logic so whatever team that's managing this you can just modify it in one place uh, and there's a bunch of other, there's a whole bunch of other options and configuration you can get with API with oscillate API gateway I think you can make aggregated calls which I might take advantage of meaning like you just have one endpoint here and then it goes off and makes a couple requests um i don't know I, I i've heard that you can do that i think with this but i haven't read up on that yet um but yeah i think that's it for this for this uh architecture demonstration i'm still gonna be adding a lot of pieces and i still got a ton of work to do on my docker configuration to get everything squared away uh, but you can kind of see how everything is hopefully <laughs> coming together from a system design standpoint, but uh, it's a big, big topic for sure. There's a lot, lot, lot happening here. So anyway, everyone, anyway, I uh, appreciate everyone watching and uh, take it easy.